Download Adam Sank's last comedy album on Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play. We're already in the shower together. <laughs> the risk has been taken. <laughs> if I don't blow you, the risk will have been for nothing. Warning. The program you're about to hear contains highly offensive and indecent material. Ryan, pull down your pants. <laughs> <laughs> JB, you start Let's... sucking. The host, a comedian of questionable talent, speaks incessantly on topics of a sexual and scatological nature. I will fuck you, but I will not eat you. I want that fucking dick down my throat while I'm dicking him down. I okay. hope my mother's listening. Your ass became a rosebud? Yeah, that's because I got dicked down real good. So. <laughs> he asks questions of his celebrity guests that are highly inappropriate and rude. Which of you has a bigger penis? Oh, that's a good one. That's a fun, good one. Going down on the clitoris? Oh, yes. Oh, I Absolutely. like where you're going with yep. this. For some reason... The word strap-on just comes right out of my mouth, Bianca. Yeah, you said come and strap-on at the same time. Mm -hmm. And he cannot stop talking about his buttocks. I think your butt is telling you, no mas, por favor. <laughs> this is the Adam Sank Show. If it's in my hand, I'm going to suck it. Powered by DNR Studios. <laughs> and now... The one, the only, Adam Sank! Yay! Yeah, hello, hello. Welcome to the Adam Sank Show. We are not live. But this is a brand new episode for listening at 11 a.m. Eastern on Saturday, April 18th in the year of the Corona Apocalypse at DNRstudios.com, the only place to hear this podcast live and throughout the week that it first airs. Leave us your ratings and reviews on iTunes or wherever else you listen to this podcast. Email me, me, moi, myself at adam at adamsank.com. Like the Adam Sank Show Facebook page. Download the albums. Donate to my AIDS walk, which you can get to from adamsank.com. We have an amazing show today. First of all, it's Easter Sunday that we're recording this. So happy belated Easter to all of you who celebrate and happy Passover to uh, the Jews like me. We have an incredible first time ask guest today, the legendary Miss Coco Peru. I I'm so excited about this. I've been a fan of hers for 20 years and uh, over 20 years. And um, we'll be talking to her a little later in the hour. But first, I am so excited and thrilled to announce that I have an actual co-host today. And it is none other than everyone's favorite piglet calling in from Brooklyn, Mr. Ryan Frosted. I'm trying to hit the shade bell. My shade bell's limited. Ryan, how are you? So excited for Coco Peru. This is such a special Sunday. I made quiche once again. Now, what kind of quiche did you make today? Because I know the listeners are dying to know. So, um, usually I do a spinach and mushroom quiche with um, various cheeses, uh, feta, Swiss, etc., etc. Unfortunately, this morning I did not have uh, spinach, so I just zested up the mushrooms a little bit, made them a little chunky, and put some spices in. And it was delicious. Congratulations. And you were Very quite cheesy. you were quite the chef this week because you also helped uh, your boyfriend prepare a Passover Seder. Yes. Oh, my goodness. That was such a uh, chore. I mean, it was amazing and it was beautiful and it was wonderful, but it takes a lot of work. I've never um, hosted and prepared for a Seder, really. I've always kind of just showed up, you know. And this is your first time being an adult. I know. Finally, right? Now, Ryan and I both made haroset for our respective virtual satyrs. Uh, Ryan's looked like not so much haroset as a lovely fruit salad with gigantic chunks of fruit in it. And I tried to explain to him that haroset is a spread that you spread on matzah and you can't spread like giant pieces of fruit on anything. And he got quite upset and offended. And um, it led to uh, some bad feelings. Listen, I some research on the internet and when you search haroset you see several different pictures you see uh spreadable haroset like you make and you see uh what you call a fruit salad like haroset like i made now i'll admit i could have made the uh the fruits a little bit smaller a little tinier all you had to do was pop it in a, in a food processor no i know but I, that's not how i grew up eating it the, the, the maror, the horseradish, that's what you spread. And the harosa, you don't really spread it with a knife. You that's just a lie. With a spoon. That's a lie. Place it upon the mud. You spread both. Place. Well. 
Anyway, I want to um, I want to get to our stories. Uh, Brian, you I know you have a lot to say about RuPaul's Drag Race, but um, <clears throat> I keep meaning to mention this on the air. This is like now a month old that I'm mentioning it, but I read this fabulous article in the New York Times that I just want to recommend if you know you're looking for something fun to read. Um, the it's from March 18th, and the headline was "The accusations were lies, but could they?" Pr-? Sorry. The accusations were lies, but could we prove it? It's about a lesbian couple. They're both college professors. One of them is accused of um, sexual harassment by a female student. And I'm not going to tell you anything else. It's really like one of the greatest uh, mysteries I've ever read. It's a lengthy article written by one of the women. And uh, I just think it's it's got so many interesting elements to it, and someday it will make a great movie or Netflix series. So wow. read the New York Times, The Accusations Were Lies, But Could We Prove It by Sarah Viren, V-I-R-E-N, from March 18th. Okay, now for the news. And um, this is a story about Israel. I don't think we've ever led with Israel, Ryan. I don't think so either, but I've had Israel uh, led in me. There you go. Where's my bell? I'm literally holding five different things right now. Okay. Israel has this ultra-Orthodox health minister named Yaakov Litzman. And when the coronavirus thing first started, he blamed homosexuals, of course. He said uh, he's their health minister. He's like their version of Dr. Fauci. He claimed that the coronavirus was divine punishment for homosexuality. And... This past Wednesday, uh, the news broke that the health minister, Yaakov Litzman himself, has coronavirus. Oh, my God. Well, there you go. Karma. Now, I know you're not supposed to laugh at other people's misfortune, but ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 The fact that the 70-year-old uh, Litzman has coronavirus me- meant that um, Netanyahu's entire cabinet had to be forced into isolation. And here's the thing about this fuck nut. It's not just that he's homophobic. It's also that he violated his own guidelines. He told people no, uh, you know, no getting together, practice social distancing, etc. And then he went and held a, a, a prayer service with a bunch of other devout Jews and got himself infected and infected God knows how many other people. So he's a fucking hypocrite. And then I did a real deep dive on him. He has repeatedly defended men accused of sexual assault and child molestation within the Orthodox community. So he's a real winner. Wow. Really stellar. I don't want to say I hope he... Go ahead. Yeah, but we're we're, we're seeing this globally. I mean, our our, uh, president, you know, he also is, is saying one thing and doing the other and, you know... Uh, anyone that uh, ever had doubts about the coronavirus and whether it was, uh, you know, a valid threat to our society, most of those people ended up getting it. So there you go. There you go. Um, and by the way, I just watched One of Us on Netflix. It's a documentary about three people trying to leave the Hasidic community, the ultra-Orthodox mm. Hasidic Jews. Yes. Really, really fascinating and troubling. And I feel now more than ever that Hasidib- Hasidism is no different from any other cult. It's no different from any other extremist fundamentalist group, whether they're Christians, Muslims, Jews. They are disgusting, awful people that, destro- uh-huh. that control people and destroy their lives. And once again, the difference between a religion and a cult is what happens when you try to leave it. When you try to leave a religion, they say, go with God. When you try to leave a cult, they destroy your life. And that's what the Hasidim do. They, they are the, the worst people on earth. And after watching that documentary, I feel very strongly that New York state and city needs to do something. Because these there are women getting married off at the age of 18 and being forced to have literally a dozen a dozen children each and they have no freedom and they have no choice the marriages are arranged and if and when they decide they want to leave you have to watch the documentary it is it's terrible what happens to them well 
you know, we've been talking about um, uh, Unorthodox. We just finished it. Yes, which is a fictionalized uh, version of of um, a one woman's memoir about what happened when she tried to leave. Yes. Very, very important. We're um, seeing these stories brought to the forefront. Good, and good. I'm glad. Yes. On a much lighter note, Ellen DeGeneres is in hot water again. <laughs> oh, dear. Come on, Ellen. The last time we spoke on the podcast about her, it was because there were rumors of her being secretly mean. <laughs> I'm secretly mean. But now, now it's because she made a joke. She was making a little video from home, as many celebrities are doing, and she said, quote, this is like being in jail. That's what it is. It's mostly because, and then she said, it's mostly because I've been wearing the same clothes for 10 days and because everyone here is gay. Now, I don't find that joke offensive when told by a gay person. I think it's, reasonably funny and like not a big deal but the woke keyboard warriors freaked the fuck out and said that you know first of all it's really not funny to to joke about people in prison being gay and moreover Ellen is saying that she's in jail while sitting in her multi-million dollar luxury compound in Southern California right yeah, no, it's like I I am not offended by that, but I I now like when I whenever I hear jokes or any sort of like I I, I feel like I, I hear it through the uh, filter of like how are woke millennials going to respond to this, and I and I I know when it's it's a no and when it's a yes, and in this case with Ellen, unfortunately, it's a no. Yeah, well. She apparently listened to the backlash because the Washington Post reports that as of Wednesday afternoon, the YouTube video appeared to have been made private. A tweeted version sent from the the Ellen Show's account had been deleted. CNN reported that the video was listed as unavailable on YouTube. Um, Today, it's back... uh, Today, meaning when this story was written, the video had reappeared on Ellen's channel, but the joke had been edited out Oh my god, wild. So again, I think um, it was a pretty harmless joke. I think gay people are allowed to joke about other gay people. And she wasn't saying her home was a prison. She was, you're not getting the joke if you're offended by that part of it. She, she was saying, how is this like prison? Well, I've been wearing the same clothes for 10 days in a row and everyone here is gay. She wasn't literally saying that her home was like a prison. She knows she lives in a mansion. People, you know, save your fucking outrage for Donald Trump. Save your outrage for Yakov Litzman. To people who really des- people who really deserve it are enemies. Not fucking Ellen, who's just trying to be funny. If you didn't find it funny, move on. Not every joke is for you. All right, on that note, it is time to turn it over to Ryan for his RuPaul's Drag Race update. Shantae, and, uh, you stay. Ryan. On the most recent episode, which was uh, Friday the 11th, um, let's see, Britta went home, and Gigi Good was <sighs> declared the winner. How do you feel about both of those decisions? Well, obviously, once we saw Aiden Zane go home, Britta's storyline was pretty much uh, finished, I think. I think that that was um, what she was there to do. They obviously wanted her to be the villain, and they edited it that way, and this was the episode we finally got to see her off. And I'm I'm relieved because I know Britt is a great performer. I've seen her here in New York, but the show doesn't always showcase people in the way that they should be showcased. So I was happy to see her go. As far as Gigi winning, look, it's clear she is the front runner at this point, maybe with Sherry Pye being the other front runner, but obviously we're not going to see her be crowned. She's talented, she's versatile, she she can turn a look, she can uh, perform, she's funny, she's got it all. I felt that um, her runway, it, it, her runway wasn't enough for me to see her as the winner of this challenge or to see her as the only winner. I would have loved to have seen her share this one with Jen. Week after week after week, we've seen Jen face and they have been creating this story, this edit about her being this, like, 
underdog, safe every time, but you know, likable and and constantly putting her like her all into every look, every challenge. Um, I thought she killed it. Uh, Gigi was great. I would have loved to have seen them share the win. Now, I. Uh, you and I disagree slightly about this. First of all, I think Gigi is by far the most talented queen of the season. Um, yes. Better than Jan, better than Sherry Pie, better than any of them. It be, and, and what floored me about Friday night's episode was we saw Jan really struggling in the choreography. And then when she came out on stage as uh, True Blue Madonna, she, or whatever they called her, that that era of Madonna's life. Oh, you mean Gigi? Gigi. Gigi really slayed it. She was... Oh, my God, I know. Unbelievable. And she, and her dancing was fantastic. It seems like there's nothing she's bad at. Whereas Jan, yes, Jan has a beautiful voice, the best voice in the competition by far, and she yes. killed the singing. But her performance was just fine. It wasn't... I just... It wasn't captivating. Yeah, I... I that I just think that the judging has notoriously been questionable and if Rue had given that challenge to Jan and, and declared her the winner uh, no one would have had any issue with that no, I, I think, think that the, would have they were in the I think they were in the top two I also think that um, Crystal Method was fantastic she was she really this was I was so happy for her and I really like her she's a sweetheart um, I really like her energy and I like her drag I like that she listens to the judges I mean look when she leaves when she's out of the race um, she can do whatever she wants with her face but in a competition you have to listen to the judges you have to show that you're adaptable you have to show that you um, can rise to the occasion and in this case I really think she did I thought she was she was wonderful I also love Jada I thought Jada yes um, did a great job um, but you know what? one of the things that I enjoyed so much about the episode, um, besides seeing Britta go home. Um, I really, I love Heidi. I love what she brings to the lip syncs. There's a rawness that is exciting to me because, you know, she, she, she's, she's clearly one of the underdogs, I would say, of the, of the season, but I think we're going to see her go far. I think Rue obviously, you know, uh, loves her. Rue really loves a lot of the girls this year. Gigi, Crystal, Heidi. Um, so we'll see how that all uh, turns out. Yes, well, but, you you mentioned Aiden uh, a few minutes ago, and we must talk yes. about some backlash that Aiden has uh, met with since leaving the show. First of oh, all, yes. uh, listeners will recall that when Aiden left, it was because of his terrible impersonation of actress Patricia Quinn in the Snatch Game. Well, Patricia Quinn herself has weighed in on the performance. First first of all, she said, I, I, she, this is the quote, disgusted beyond belief. <laughs> Liar. I do not know this utterly untalented person shite. He called me a drug addict and knew nothing about me. Disappointing. And as I said to Ryan when this story came out, if you're going to lie about knowing someone and having had lunch with them, like, pick someone more exciting than Patricia Quinn. Like, right. who, who the fuck makes up that they had lunch with Patricia Quinn? I think Aiden is demented. I just, it's so embarrassing. I mean, I think that people were starting to kind of uh, feel for her as sort of as a victim to British bullying. And then all to find out that she's just blatantly making up uh, details about her relationships with, with like, D-list celebrities. And, um, and these are real people. And, you know, it's like, she may not be in the, um, she may not be, like, an A-list celebrity, but she, she's a person out there that, like, this is, this is her being represented. And in some ways, it's like, lady, at least people are paying attention to Well, and, and she's not, she's not known for using drugs or being a drug addict. Like, it'd be one thing if someone was impersonating Anna Nicole Smith, who was, you know, without a doubt, took a lot of drugs and died of a drug overdose. It would be in bad taste. Did, did any of the queens ever do her, by the way? Uh, yes. Adored Delano, season six. 
it was one of the best snatch games ever. It was hilarious. So, you know, you can do that. You could, if someone wanted to be Keith Richards, you know, they could play him as a drug addict because it's, he, he's admitted to drug use. But you can't just assign a drug addiction to a, to a living person without any evidence. I, I'm surprised RuPaul didn't say something like, hey, by the way, we don't actually know if Patricia Quinn's ever used drugs, you know, like just to protect the show. Right. But also, Aiden has now met with um, backlash over old tweets that appear to be racist and transphobic. This is this queen. <laughs> this She's messy. Is more problematic than Sherpa at this point. Well, I wouldn't say that, but she's no, definitely no, problematic. Now, before we move on, uh, there is some new information, and, and not even new information, just like more detail coming out about Sherry Pie and the victims, the men that she victimized. Do you want to expound on that a bit? Um, well, basically, we're finding out now that there were 12 victims that came forward publicly, but it seems that there may be up to uh, 40 additional victims that did not, did not want to publicly come forward but had the same experience um, with Sherry Pie. And it just kind of shed light on the fact that this is this is someone that, you know, obviously is very sick and had a um, uh, an expanded sort of operation going as Allison Mosey. Yeah, I mean the the amount of time and energy that Joey slash Sherry put in to manipulating these men it's 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 almost hard to believe. Like, it was like her full time job was catfishing these guys, and some of them were close close friends. It would be like if I said to to Ryan, like, "Hey Ryan, I have a role that would, you'd be perfect for," and then spent the next year and a half like getting you to like read scenes and take steroids, and and then you find out that like the, all along it's me and I'm the casting director and there's no role. Like it's so insidious. Well, and I think that it's just, it's kind of spooky because, you know, when you see someone like Sherry Pie on RuPaul's Drag Race, you see a seasoned queen. You see a, 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 a someone that understands the craft, that, that really just put in a lot of time and, and, and work. And it's like, how does someone like that, how is someone like that able to balance this, like, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Hyde lifestyle. I, I honestly it's just, think... It's mind-boggling. I think he's a sociopath. And, you know, I, I saw this YouTube video that some queen put together um, where he basically was, was rerunning interviews that two of the, the main victims, Ben and Daniel, um, not the Daniel we had on our show, but this Daniel Baranda, I think is his last name, who was, like, Joey's best friend for two years and co-hosted a show with Sherry Pie, a weekly show at Rebar in New York City. And they both said, because people have asked them, first of all, they're being attacked. People are sending them death threats. Sherry Pie's fan base is growing. And these fucking assholes who don't seem to understand that real harm was done to these guys are just, like, attacking the victims. But they were, they've both been asked, why did you wait until Drag Race, until Sherry was on the show to come out, come forward with these allegations? And I think this is such a good reason. They both said, because once Drag Race airs, Sherry Pie is a much bigger celebrity with a much bigger following, and she, she now has more power to, to manipulate people. I mean, think about Harvey Weinstein. Think about these rich, famous, powerful men who victimize dozens of, of, of people because they can, because they have, they're in a position to do that. If Sherry Pie becomes as famous as Bianca Del Rio, think about what she can do. She doesn't yeah. even, she doesn't even need Allison Mosey anymore. Now she can just do it on her own. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, even Ben Shumkus in his original post, you know, he acknowledged that, that Sherry is someone that is charming and likable um, as a performer and if she had gone through this season without these, um, these 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 guys coming forward, she would have had this just like huge fan base that then if anyone were to come forward, they would shut them down. 
Absolutely. So. I think they came forward at the right time, but more importantly, victims decide when they want to come forward. Exactly. It's no one else's business. Hold on. My bell yeah. is so sad today. I knew that was coming. Okay. Moving on. Uh, here's a story that caught my eye and the eye of many gay men who live in Hell's Kitchen. Uh, in Hell's Kitchen neighborhood here in New York City. Uh, a 30-year-old man uh, organized a grinder hookup. Yes, during the corona apocalypse, when we're not even supposed to be in the same room, he had an anonymous trick come over to have sex with that he met on Grinder. But when the person showed up, they entered his apartment at 1.30 a.m., and a short time later, he let in an accomplice... Armed with a pistol. Surprise, motherfucker. The two guests tied up their host and two other people who were in the apartment, put bags over their heads. One of the robbers punched him in the face and threatened to kill him. They ransacked the apartment and cleaned out a safe that was filled with $12,500 in cash. Sorry, I hit the bell early. Now, there were many questions about this. Once again... It's not a good time to be having sex with anyone that you're not quarantined with, let alone a stranger that you meet on Grinder. But more importantly, who has $12,500 in a safe in their apartment? Can you say drug dealer? Yeah. This was no ordinary robbery. I'm sorry. This was some queen, maybe a rival dealer, who knew that this guy had, had money in his in his apartment maybe the money was owed maybe it was just an all out theft but you don't have $12,000 sitting in a safe unless you're up to no good so i'm not saying anyone deserves to be robbed or or, or violated this way but uh, there's well, more I, there's more to this story yeah. than meets the eye yeah, i think we might uh, i don't think this is the last we've heard of the story no and once again Grinder and Scruff are dangerous in, during the best of times. Yeah, so especially during the worst of times. It, it, it is so wild how many people are trying to... Oh! Yesterday, someone, like, I think his name was, like, Raw Bareback Fun, was like, hey, you hosting? And I was like, no. We're in the middle of a pandemic. I'm not hosting. I'm hosting my dog. And my hand. Exactly. Meanwhile... During the quarantine, the worldwide quarantine, people are really bored, as you know, and everyone's doing all kinds of shenanigans online, on social media, and coming up with creative projects. So two gay men in the UK recreated the movie Jurassic Park with their dog playing the T-Rex. A... uh, Uh, The host of something called London Live, Anthony Baxter, and his partner Rob Slade posted the end result to Twitter with the message, the dog was so bored he made us do this. Baxter and Slade each... Baxter and Slade each took on different roles from the classic Steven Spielberg movie and brought some of the best-known lines to life. Um, The Tyrannosaurus Rex was played by Yoke, the French bulldog, the video has been viewed over 7,000 times. It's really, it's, it's more of a, a visual than anything else, but if you'd like to see it, I posted it on the Adam Sank Show Facebook page. Uh, Thank you. I do think the gays are just so creative. We really are. We're going to save this whole pandemic from being a total devastating, uh, a horrible experience because we're going to bring joy and we're going to make things fabulous and cute and... Uh, whimsical and that's what we're here to do we're so fucking entertaining we really are you know frank DeCaro was on the show last week and he said that's our job right now like anyone who's funny anyone who's creative anyone who is artistic like our job right now is to just put stuff out that keeps people laughing and entertained and interested and you know that's that's the that's the way we can help during this time i agree as well as staying home and making quiche. That is, that is my religion, honestly. Uh, what else was I going to tell you? Oh, last night I get this text from my mother. She goes, turn on YouTube right now. <laughs> and, uh, Adam. 
I was, I was like, I don't know what that means. Where, what on YouTube? She goes, Seder. Type in Seder on YouTube. And I was like, can you just send me the link to what you're watching? And she was like, no, type in Seder. Seder, by the way, for those of you who are not Jewish, that's the, the traditional Passover meal. So I type in Seder, and sure enough, it takes me to a live stream of all of these like Broadway stars. They did a benefit called Saturday Night Seder. And it was like Adina Menzel and all these other Jewish uh, theater people. Oh, yeah. And they raised money for um, the CDC. So great. I forgot to watch it. I'm going to have to watch it today. But <laughs> turn on it. YouTube. Turn it on. Just turn on the YouTube. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of people putting funny things online during this time, there's, a, there's an actor slash social media personality slash host named Emerson Collins. Do you know him? Yes. Uh, he's on that, um, I don't remember if it was on Bravo. Bravo, or, The or People's he, Couch. Yeah. With Scott Nevins. Yeah. Uh, he shared a minute-long video on his social media instructing followers on how to turn a jock strap into a face mask. The, the caption was, Jock strap mask tutorial because why not? The internet may be out of masks, bandanas, and scarves, but it's not out of jock straps, he explains. And yes, straight boys, you can make it with that sad, tired jock strap you still have from high school football. <laughs> Uh, Queer T, which which linked the uh, the post, said, "Just for the record, Queer T does not endorse wearing a jock strap as a face mask to protect yourself against coronavirus." <laughs> <laughs> but I did kind of do a deep dive on Emerson Collins's Instagram. You know, he's kind of cute in a twinky way, mm-hmm. um, but he has a lot of thirst trap photos, and in some of them, he appears to have a very large penis. I'm sure you will be flooding into his DMs. I I literally wrote right I literally commented on one of them. Nice dick. <laughs> you whore. So after this is over, let's see what happens between me and Emerson Collins. All right, so Ryan, we still have ten minutes before Miss Coco calls in, and I am at the end of my stories. Oh my goodness, how did that happen? You I, always have something to say. I know, I didn't think we'd go through this so quickly, but luckily I do have a backup story, which I will now bring up. Better be a good one. I, <laughs> I don't know if it's that good, but it's one of those it's one of those list items, and you know what? I love a list. Uh, yeah, we love a list. This is from Queerty, and it's the 10 movies about male strippers to quench your thirst during quarantine. Okay. I must tell you... There's 10 of them? There's 10. And I must tell you, I don't know most of these movies, but I do have a dog walker who, um, every time he comes to my house to walk the dog, he also watches something on either my Netflix or my Hulu, and they're exclusively these kinds of movies. <laughs> oh, my God. Any cheesy, low-budget movie that involves male flesh, he's watched. So, um, this, the first is called This One's for the Ladies from 2018. Never heard of it. This acclaimed documentary tells of the hundreds of horny women in New Jersey who get together every Thursday for a potluck dinner and the chance to throw dollar bills at some of the hottest male dancers in the state. I guess they have they hire strippers to come to their potluck dinners and strip for them. Mm, I love that. This one's for the ladies. Um, there's a 2013 movie called I'm a Stripper. It's actually a five-part docuseries charting the lives of male dancers and boylesque performers around the country. I feel like my, my listeners who are driving right now are pulling over to write these down. Mm-hmm. Putting your notes. It strives, it strives to answer such questions as, how do straight boys feel about dancing for nudes? For, uh, sorry, for dudes. <laughs> <laughs> and how do gay boys feel about dancing for the ladies? Um, this next movie we know very well because we've had the director on the ass before. It's all male, all nude Johnsons. Yes. The sequel to his original, this is Gerald McCulloch's movie, a sequel to his original all male, all nude, which was 2017. Um, we had Gerald on both times. He was the very first guest we ever had on the Adam Sank show. Oh, that's right before I was even... Before around. you were even born. I know. I was just a fetus in your gay stomach. <laughs> That's so disgusting. <laughs> what an image. I just had this image of you as a tiny little fetus. 
with your with your beard and your mustache. <laughs> <laughs> we gonna have Anya do, do a, an illustration of that. Yeah. Anya, if you're listening. <laughs> Anya, if you're listening, please draw a picture of Ryan as a fetus in my pregnant stomach. Thank you. Uh, 2012 is Magic Mike. Or Magic Mike is from. Oh, yes. Magic that was Mike a big is from. Deal when that came out. Magic Mike is fantastic. Uh, is. Really one of my favorite movies. The sequel is Garbage. Wait, can I say something? Please. You know this list that we're going around, like, ten things that I don't care for that everyone loves? Yes, I, I, did, I did mine on the last episode. I, I, I still haven't been. <laughs> I only have six things yet, so I keep adding to them. Channing Tatum I put on that list. <gasps> I am deeply offended. Like, he's, he's sexy. I wouldn't kick him out of bed, but I'm just not, like... You're out of I, your mind. He is... I don't... Like maybe my he's like my perfect man, but you know what it well, is. Great in the movie. You don't like smooth skin. Yes, that's it. You that's like it. you like like hairy kind of dirty looking pigs, and I like like smooth Nazi looking guys who look like they would have beaten me up in high school. Like that turns me on for some reason. Wow. Yeah. Um, what about? It says a lot about me and where I'm coming from. Okay, so here's a movie from way back in 1983 called A Night in Heaven. Huh. Now, this is nope. this is starring Christopher Atkins, who was briefly a huge sex symbol in the 80s after starring in The Blue Lagoon with Brooke Shields. Um, oh, yes. Atkins plays Ricky, a struggling college student who moonlights as an exotic dancer. When his professor accidentally catches his act, it sparks an attraction that leads to erotic passions, loss of innocence, and tragedy. That sounds good. A Night in Heaven. Um, okay, here's a, uh, one from 2014 called Le Bear. And this is very strange. So Joe Manganiello, one of the hottest men on the planet, married to Sofia Vergara, he was in Magic Mike, and for some reason he got so interested in male stripping after that that he made his own documentary in 2014 called La Bear, which is about La Bear Dallas, one of the most popular male strip clubs in the world. La Bear. La Bear. 1997, we have The Full Monty, of course. Oh, La Bambi. Which was turned into one of my favorite Broadway musicals ever. Boy, is that a great musical. Mm-hmm. Wonderful music. There, there's a song in that that if I ever get married, and I'm not saying I'm going to, I want to walk. Know. I want to walk down the aisle to it. Oh. It's the one that goes. Breeze off the river, right? No, it goes. Um, over the hillside, down in the valley, never alone, for you walk with me. It's really beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Here's one. Thank you. Here's one from 2015 called Chocolate City. Oh. Michael, aka Sexy Chocolate, is an aspiring dancer who lands a dream gig at one of the hottest nightclubs in town. The work is fun and the money is good. Hiding his new job from his family, however, proves to be much more difficult. In 2019, there was a movie called Strip and War. Definitely the most obscure film on the list, this short Polish documentary tells of the tense relationship between a grandfather, who's a retired army general, and his stripper grandson who likes to party and have sex. Where the, filmmaker, wow. where the filmmakers found these two subjects is anyone's guess, but it's absolutely fascinating. Once again, that's called Strip and War. I may have to watch that. Yeah, that sounds actually really interesting. Uh, here's one from 2002 called Just Can't Get Enough. Boogie Nights I just can't get enough. enough. Boogie Nights meets the Thunder from Down Under in this 2002 thriller about the crime-ridden history of Chippendales. The story centers around Chippendales founder Steve Banerjee, who was arrested for hiring a hitman to kill his business partner and choreographer and then killed himself in prison. Oh, my God. Wow. Fans of Fans of this movie might also be interested in the documentary version called The Chippendales Murder. It was a 2000 made-for-TV movie star... Oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't a documentary. It was a TV movie starring Naveen Andrews. I'm interested in this. Wait, what is that one called? The, the movie 
that Queer Tea recommends is called Just Can't Get Enough. That's the Chippendales one? Yeah. And that's it. Those are the 10 movies about male strippers that you can watch. I'm actually glad I did this story because there's a lot of these that I would like to watch. And you know what? This is the time to watch them. Exactly. I, I've been watching so much Netflix. Me too. Because I never really, I'm not like a huge TV person, you know, of some repulse drag race. But now I have fucking all the time in the world. So I'm finally like sitting down. I'm about to start Big Little Lies. I'm actually like because I'm someone who I, I watch repeat. You love TV. I love TV and I watch a lot of reruns. Like anytime I happen to stumble on Friends, even though I've seen every episode a hundred times, I'll still sit and watch it. But nowadays, when I do that, I feel guilty because I'm like, no, there's so many new shows I should be watching and I should be using this quarantine time to like catch up on everything. So I started watching The Good Wife. Mm-hmm. Which I had never watched before, um, and I watched it because my neighbor Adam was like, "Oh my God, it's the best show ever! You will love it." I gotta tell you, it's fine. It's to me, it's like every other procedural. It's like Law and Order. It's like um, what, are, what are some other procedurals? You know, the, every episode is yeah. a, is a new case. I, I don't. Those don't really capture my imagination. I get bored with them. I know. I, I'm there with you on that. And this one... I feel like a lot of them sort of are the same. And, this, and The Good Wife has mo- a little more going for it because there's an ongoing through line about the main character, Juliana Margulies, and her ne'er-do-well husband, played by Chris Noth. Um, and, you know, you sort of find out new information each episode about what he's done and what he hasn't done. Ooh, here's our guest. Hold on, please. <laughs> Okay, our guest today is making her debut on The Ass, but I have been a huge fan of hers for decades. Ever since I saw her incredible performance in the 1999 movie Trick, she is one of America's truly legendary queens and currently guest starring on Will and Grace. She joins us all the way from sunny Los Angeles. Please give a warm ass welcome to Miss Coco Peru. Good morning. Coco, how are you, my dear? I'm still trying to wake up, but I got up at 6 so I'd get the ca- lots of caffeine so I could be uh, somewhat intelligent with you guys here. We cannot thank you enough for joining us. I know it's early in L.A. How are you surviving the corona apocalypse? I think just like everybody else, hunkering down and, you know, just dealing with it. I'm reading books. I'm doing things that I don't normally get to do. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I'm doing is I'm icing my feet because I have had just after years of damaging my feet, you just get used to the pain. Yeah. And uh, and now I'm actually doing some self-care when it comes to my feet. So that's one thing I've been doing. Are your feet fucked up because of wearing heels so often and yes. on stage? Yes. Yes. And I, you know, what's crazy is I have worn a sensible heel only two inches because I can't do anything higher for my whole career. Yeah. So I look at these girls wearing like six inch heels and I think, oh, honey, you have no idea what you're in store for. I don't understand how anyone does it. I, ca- I cannot walk in heels, which is one of many reasons why I could never be a drag queen. Uh, well, I had an injury years ago, so I can only do, that's the re- only reason why I can only do a two inch heel, because otherwise I just tip over like a tree. <laughs> Coco, I have a million questions for you, but the first thing I want to ask is how did you first arrive at your signature look with the iconic bobbed wig and what made you stick with that? I, um, I was, my husband just walked into the room where I disappeared and he's annoying me. Get out. All right. Is he naked? No. (laughs) (laughs) We've both been eating so much. We're absolutely horrified. (laughs) Yes. Same. We actually were like working towards summer, you know, and that just went to hell. But, um, (laughs) My look was the you know my first wig I've talked about this before was it was more of an um, an Anne Margaret look it was a big wig but my my niece's friend Frank took care of my wig but he did it for free 
and it got to the point where every time I walked into his salon, I could sense he was just like, oh, this bitch is here again. And um, I was desperate to come up with something that I could take care of since that is not my art, you know, doing hair or makeup. And so um, the flip was just more out of, it was something simple and that I could take care of. I loved the silhouette of it. And as soon as I put it on, I realized, oh my gosh, this, this is actually even better than what I had been working with. So it was more just out of desperation that I came up with that look. But once I had it on me, I knew that was it. And now I've tried to change it a few times and the fans just go crazy. Yeah, because it's, it's who you are, you know? It's, it'd be like seeing Bianca Del Rio without her eyelashes. Exactly. It's become this thing where um, the few times I did try to change it, I, uh, people wrote me very uh, terse emails and or would come up to me afterwards. And this one guy even pointed in my face and was crying, this isn't what I paid for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the gays. Y- you know, yeah. I'm wondering how many of those of that same wig do you own? You have to have different versions of it, right? You know, for years I didn't, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago I actually, someone asked me that and said, how many uh, of these do you have? And I said, just the one. I take very good care of my things. And the person said, but what if something happened to that one while you were on the road? Yeah, and I, I, I said, I was like, oh my God, why didn't I ever think of that? Yeah. So now I, I have at least two at all times. Oh, it's so funny because I picture like 50 of the same wig sitting in your closet, but only two. I have that kind of room. So. <laughs> I want to I talk about Trick because it was such an important movie for me um, when it came out. I was 28 at the time, and I just, it, 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 you know, seeing it with all my friends is one of my happiest memories of like the 90s. And I just watched it again Thursday night in preparation for this interview, and it has aged so well. It, it really is a one of the most charming films and you are unbelievably good in it. I I understand that the filmmakers created that role especially for you and I'm wondering if you could sort of elaborate on that. I had been asked to, to help Jim Fall who directed it audition people for the first reading and the first reading was actually five years before the movie ever got made. So um, I said, yeah, sure, I'll help you and then when it was over he said, you know what? why don't you do the role of Catherine, which later went to Tori Spelling, for the reading? Because I don't, you're so funny in the auditions, I, that's, I want you to do it. And I'll just explain to everyone that the role will really be played by a woman. You know, so I um, said, sure. And when it was all over, everyone said, you have to keep the drag queen in the movie. Uh, so they then wrote me um, a monologue. And then Jason Schaefer, who wrote it, was kind enough to let me rewrite it in my voice, you know, so. And, uh, and that's so, that's, that's probably so important to your performance in the film because it, it doesn't feel like a performance. It feels like just you talking to this guy and being yourself. And, and I understand you came up with the line, it burns. That, yeah, it's big, it's beautiful, and you're going to love it was another one because someone actually said that to me one night in my apartment building. And uh, this beautiful Latino boy wanted to come upstairs. I was dressed as Coco at the time, and and um, he he was trying to invite himself up to my apartment, and I kept saying no, 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 because I had just met my future husband, and um, and he literally looked down at his crotch, and he was in, he had, you know he was huge and, and and erect, and he said he looked back up at me, and he said it's big, it's beautiful, and you're gonna love it, and I walked up the stairs, and I said I I said um, you know, someday I'm going to use that line in something. So it ended up in, in, in... And to this day, I regret not having that boy up to my my apartment. What was I thinking? I would say so. <laughs> I would have I would have not... Uh, boyfriend or no, I would have invited him up. Exactly. You know, you live, you learn. Coco, you first appeared uh, on Will and Grace in 2001 in an iconic Thanksgiving episode called Movable Feast, and it's one of the funniest visual gags I've ever seen on TV because it's a four-way phone conversation, five-way, and you're basically silent for most of it, and it starts out you're, you're as a man, and by the end you're in full cocoa drag. Can you, can you sort of yeah, talk about that? Yeah, 
Yeah. I, I tell them, I said, you know, drag queens across the world who see this episode are not are gonna, you know, not believe. No one can get ready and drag that fast, but um, you know, magic of television. <laughs> but um, it was so much fun, and we 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 actually filmed that in real time. Where they had five different little miniature sets in a circle with the camera on each of us. And we set our lines. And then, of course, they waited for me to get in drag. And then we finished the last moment by myself, you know. But um, that was so much fun. And, and I, I was thrilled to be invited back for this last, you know, two seasons yes so much fun with them they they built a whole set around you 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 now have your own bar i know and it's wild because you think back to when that show first aired you know they didn't show two men kiss they didn't um right it was different world back then there were only so many things they could get away with and and even my character was like a drag queen that still lives with her mom and you know it was and and then they never they never expanded upon a drag character you know, and now when they invited me back, it was here I was marrying Jack and his partner, and I owned a bar. And I also think that the um, producers and some of the writers were fans of mine, and they, I think they just felt like this queen had survived all these years doing her own thing without the benefit of being on a reality show, and they really wanted to just celebrate me. So they built that whole bar, they made that neon sign of my hair. They even made little coasters oh. with my logo on it that no one would ever see, but they just wanted to celebrate those little details. I want I'm those so coasters. I know, they threw them out at the audience like this little gift. It's so brilliant, and I was uh, when I was reading about you in preparation, I saw that you're you're married to a man from Spain. And I'm wondering, did the writers, did that inspire the writers to come up with Jack's husband being from Spain, or is that just coincidence? I I think I don't know. I mean, I do know that some of my friends that are writers on the show and Max Munch and I can create it. They've seen the show where I I make jokes about being married to a Spaniard and getting married in a castle. So it was funny that all of a sudden Jack's, you know, dating a Spaniard and then getting supposed to be getting married in a castle. Um, so maybe it was inspired. I, I, I don't know, but um, I'd like to think that maybe it was. Well, I, I love seeing you on there. You're actually my favorite thing about the reboot. Coco, you have a long running YouTube series called Conversations with Coco in which you interview just an, an amazing icons, everyone from Liza Minnelli to Jane Fonda. When this is all over, this pandemic, w- will that series continue? Actually, I haven't done that in a while um, because they were just, li- actually, they weren't for YouTube, but they were just live events. And then um, we were trying to turn it into a TV series, which has been very difficult. Um, but it's still being kind of optioned and we'll see where it goes but because it was supposed to be turned into it they were trying to sell it as a tv thing um i haven't been able to do them as live events but um i'd love to get back into that because it is so much fun i would love that i think there would be a, a very wide audience for that especially with all of the drag queens that have youtube series nowadays you know whether it was on youtube or some other platform i, I think that oh, I agree. it could be and hugely I, popular I, and the nice thing about these events is that um, each of the guests sort of came maybe feeling a little bit, um, I don't want to say intimidated, uh, but maybe concerned about the fact that a drag queen was interviewing Maybe not Liza because she knew me, and but just thinking like, oh, can't be, maybe it might be a little bit... Um, Silly. I hope she doesn't make fun of me, type yeah. of thing. And then it became this really in-depth conversation, and you could see each of these photos after about 15 minutes just to relax and realize that they were in good hands. And then they actually started, you know, uh, at one point, Jane Fonda said cock ring, and I was like, oh my God, Jane Fonda just said cock ring. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Coco, just kind of relaxed and opened up. In the time remaining, uh, we're going to play everyone's favorite game. Normally, we have a pre-recorded bumper for this, but Ryan and I will have to sing it. So the game is Ask Me No Questions. Ask Me No Questions. Ask Me No Questions. Yeah. 
Has uh, Has Miss Coco Peru ever been to Peru? Yes, that's where I was first inspired. That's where the name came from. Yes, uh, my first boyfriend was Peruvian. Oh, wow, you really like the Latin men. <laughs> I like all men, sweetheart. <laughs> all right, I heard that. I have been around the world. And I, I, I. <laughs> Who's the meanest drag queen you've ever encountered? Who's the meanest drag queen I've ever encountered? I don't know. I don't. I get along with all the uh, all these other drag queens. Safe answer. Safe answer. I was going to say Jackie Beat has the reputation, but she's really a sweetie pie. Well, that's good to hear. Who's someone? Yeah. Uh, who's someone that you never got to interview on Conversations with Coco who would rock your world? Uh, there's a couple: Shirley MacLaine and uh, Dolly Parton. Uh, they would both be amazing. I would. I would think they would both do it too. Uh, I don't know. I did Lily Tomlin, and I've done the Jane Fonda, so I'm feeling like I need to do Dolly Parton just to complete that, you know, the triangle. The nine, the nine to five nine trio. To five. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Who's been your favorite interview so far? I can't say, because they really all meant something so special to me. I, honestly, I, there's no way I could pick a favorite. You're married to a man from Spain. Say something dirty to us in Spanish. Um, uh, Foyeme. <laughs> Very simple, but but important <laughs> phrase to know if you're ever traveling through Spain. Fuck me. Well, what's the one I, I, I'd like to say? It's um, chupame, chupame. Yes, yeah, suck yeah. me. Yes, chupame. Even Ryan knows that. Oh, yes. <laughs> Ryan and I went to Mexico. <laughs> Ryan and I went to Mexico City together for a week, and all he learned was chupame. Yeah, well, there's, there's lollipops called chupas and chupa, so I just think chupame is cute. <laughs> what has been the most exciting day or night of your life so far? Oh God, I've had I've had many exciting days and nights, from like the tawdry, dirty nights to flying in a helicopter with Liza Minnelli. Wow, tell us about that. I spent a weekend with Liza Minnelli out on uh, in Atlantic City. Uh, we, she invited me to spend a weekend with her in the house while she was working. What year was this? And Oh God, it was a long, long time ago. And when, um, and when she uh, was finished with her concert, they took her and I to a heliport. And next thing you know, I'm on a helicopter flying up in New York City with Liza Minnelli. It was so magical, I couldn't believe it. That's... That sounds like a dream. Like it a, was a dream. every gay dream. I know, and I, I, I tell a story about it in my show, and it truly was uh, amazing. And she was so sweet and kind and full of it, um, wisdom. You know, as kooky as she comes across, she's, you know, quite, quite smart. She seems like a, a lovely person. Yes. Coco, I cannot thank you enough for waking up early on Easter Sunday to talk to us. This has been a dream of mine to have you on the show. And uh, when we're, when, when, the, when the pandemic is over and we're back in the studio and you're ever in New York, we would love to have you live in studio. I'd love yes, that. Please. How can people follow you on the internet? They can go to any of my social media web uh, things, whatever they call them, and um, definitely my website, cocoperu.com. And if they sign up to my email, uh, they'll get an email with different dates where I'm performing when I can get back to work. And I don't abuse that, but I, send, I rarely send out emails. Fabulous. Well, thank you again, and give your husband a big kiss and a big chupa. For both of us. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> I will. I adore you. Thanks, Thank Coco. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. And I want to thank Ryan Frostig for being my co-host. This worked out pretty well, right, Ryan? Yes, this is amazing. Next Saturday, Thank you for having me. I, anytime, we'll do this again next week. Tune in next Saturday to hear another brand new ass, As God is My Witness. I will keep doing these from home as long as I have to. Oh, here's something important, Ryan. I just spent 150 bucks on a new microphone. Oh. So hopefully by next week, this will sound a hell of a lot better. That is how dedicated I am to my listeners and this podcast. So everyone should subscribe at dnrstudios.com, download my comedy albums, follow me, me, on Twitter and Instagram at Adam Sank. Follow Ryan at Ryan Frosting. Email me at adam at adamsank.com. Have a great week, bitches. Stay healthy, stay safe. Bye.